going to take out the tub. My expectation, although I hope it's not true, is that this tile is on um, some laid cement. So in other words, there's some lathing um, that they embedded with cement and then they put the tile over that. Uh, sometimes this is what they call sandwiching. Sometimes it's sheetrock and then sheetrock and then tile over that. But because of the age of the house, my expectation is that this is a very heavy wall, but it might not be. So I might get lucky on this one. But the wall is going to come out first. Once the wall comes out uh, from that, um, actually I just cut a perimeter around the tile, pull out the whole wall. Uh, once that's out, then I'm able to unhook the tub and get the tub out of here. At that point, I'll take out the fixture. Obviously, they're going to buy a new shower fixture. It'll still go on the same side. Um, I'll be able to curb. In this case, it looks like I have about uh, probably a good part of a foot, if not 14, 15 inches between the tub and the toilet. So I'm going to try and put the curb out a little bit further so that I can get a bigger shower out of this. Um, so the curb will end up being right here going across. Um, there'll be a 2x2 two two on a mat tile um, that's going to go on the inside of the shower floor. Um, and then I think it's 1818 travertine. It's a walnut looking, you know, darker brown travertine. And the 1818 is going to go square all the way up. I think there'll probably be some type of border at this eye level here. And I believe I'm doing a niche on this back wall. Um, I'm not sure about that yet. The 1818 tile will go all the way to the top and there's going to be transition strip to go on the side here and the side here going up eight foot. Uh, transition strip is a lot cheaper than using a trim tile. Trim tiles typically are you know anywhere from five to ten dollars a lineal foot so it gets expensive. So I believe that's how this bathroom is going to go. The drain unfortunately this is a slab floor here so the drain is going to end up staying where it's at basically when I take tubs out uh, the new construction is that they have a square in here and that you're looking at dirt and so that sometimes I'm actually able to get the drain out from the wall another four or five inches and then just set it where it's at and then sometimes I can't because that square isn't big enough and then the drain will have to remain where it's at so inevitably that two by two tile will start up here at a higher um, level and then it will slant down to where that drain is going to be. Um, on wood floors I can always move the drain to center but concrete floors I can do it but it requires a lot more banging up of the concrete and everything. He doesn't want to do all that so we're going to leave the drain where it's at. And that's basically it. Okay we are about an hour, hour and a half uh, later and the tear out is done. Uh, tear outs go relatively quickly. Um, my worst fear was recognized in that uh, this was the plaster walls. Um, usually you can tell by uh, I guess about pre-90s or so it's going to be plaster and then uh, or I'm sorry pre-90s it's going to be double layer sheetrock and then after the 90s they started doing um, no my bad pre-90s would have been the lathing in the plaster and then uh, after the 90s they started doing the double layer sheetrock but either which way um, this probably weighed a good part of five to eight hundred pounds this wall here you can tell where the old lathing was at on these nails and everything uh, fortunately they only did it around where the tile was so as I said before I cut out around the perimeter and I pulled it out um, in this case because it was so old I was able to get it in good good chunks so this about half of the wall I was able to get out in one section and then another half same on that wall and then this came out in about two or three sections and, and I took it outside <coughs> um, prior to taking the tub out or trying to take the tub out the walls have to come down because if you know anything about bathtubs they have a lip the lip comes up like that and the sheetrock uh, or in this case the plaster sets right on top of the lip so you know you're precluded from taking the tub out until you actually get the walls out um, which is what happened here. So once I got the walls out, then I was able to to uh, detach the tub. Um, tubs basically are just set. In this case, they didn't even anchor the tub. Usually, there is there are some type of um, um, washer type bolts that anchor onto the studs onto that lip, and it holds the tub in place. Um, but that's not always the case. Sometimes they're just plumbed in. When they're plumbed in, they're stable. They're not going to go anywhere, especially when the sheetrock or the plaster sits on top of the lip then <clears throat> that pretty much anchors it. 
anyway so back to over here we got have kind of a mess going on I don't know the plumbing issue uh, that this guy had but uh, what you can see is a hot and a cold line that were capped off right here and here on the edge here this is actually uh, feeding the bathroom behind here um, it's feeding the vanity um, but then they went ahead and capped off um, the extension of that because you see it's teed off over here and they capped it off and then they ran the soft copper um, which is always even though it's half inch it's a different size uh, this and, and it's, it's a thicker on the inside diameter than normal copper is so um, anytime I see soft copper I kind of cringe because it's not always easy to sweat um, anyway so I'm not even gonna bother with that actually what I'm gonna do is is I'm gonna cap off the soft copper same as they capped off these lines right here and I'm gonna reuse these lines this is gonna be the cold side this is gonna be the hot side so I'm just gonna run this hot side over to, to this side of the stud run the cold side um, kind of bend it over and up it over and when I put the new fixture in it'll go be out, about right there um, since most of the copper has ran already I don't really have to do too much of a rise on that uh, but it'll get rid of all this spaghetti and everything which is you know kind of redundant and useless but it is what it is so uh, getting back to the tub area as I mentioned before the tub is usually plumbed in by virtue of that it's anchored down in this case that's exactly what happened um, so this is the old pipe now the tub uh, for those of you don't that don't know the tub is actually uh, drained with p-trap below grade on a concrete slab like this uh, the p-trap you can see it down there is below grade so in other words it's buried in the dirt um, therefore we don't need a p-trap for the shower because the p-trap is already there however we do need to transition from this inch and a half to two inch for a shower drain and trying to get that done is always kind of fun especially on a slab because you don't have too much room to work with this little box is always cut out here not cut out but it's formed in here when the slab is poured so that later on the plumber or myself or somebody else can actually you know work with the drain and the pipe and everything so it makes it easier but it's usually a small section and so trying to get an elbow on here and trying to get the bend um, correctly and, and quickly so that you can put in a shower drain is not always easy um, this is the overflow um, and I don't I don't mean to demean anybody's knowledge that's watching this but some people don't know so the way that a tub drains is you have the overflow and you have the drain itself the drain itself comes up and there was a bend over here 45 that came up and actually was where the drain is for the tub uh, the drain goes into this Y and the overflow is only there just in case you overfill the tub and and you know usually you see that silver cap there that has the thing a little underneath there that will take the water just in case so that's all you're looking at here and this is pretty standard for a tub in this particular case it's, it's old um, because it's old it's not plastic this is copper so what I did is I unscrewed that took that away and got rid of that completely and then there used to be cap over here uh, I don't know where it's at now there used to be a oh it's right here so there used to be a cap on here with a threaded male and that's where the bottom part would screw into and so I went ahead and got a sawzall again this isn't really the easiest thing to deal with because you need to be able to do a cut like this to cut off uh, to get enough depth for the new drain uh, in this case this wasn't going to work um, I had a boot that I put on here by the time I put a 45 going this way and a 45 going this way it was two inches off the concrete that's not going to work for my drain because I would have to do the fill in for the difference and therefore I don't want to do that so there's no easy way there is a little tool that I bought years ago that's never worked for me and this is a plumbing specific type of cutter and obviously you know you see the handles here and um, so if you can imagine having the pipe at the end of this wire and then you just move this wire back and forth and it's supposed to cut through this thing has never worked for the four times or five times that I've tried to use it it's just never worked it's crap so I don't even know why I still carry it but anyway um, what I normally do is get a sawzall blade in this case that's what I did um, um, you bend the saw, saw, sawzall blade you know that's straight and you bend it as much as you can so that you can get up under there and do the cut um, that's not always easy and sometimes those blades will break um, but I don't have a tool that will cut 
at that angle. So the sawzall is what I use, and which is what I did here. So if you'll notice, it's a little rough on the edge here, but it won't matter. Um, the danger is, if you cut down too far, you can't get enough bite on this plastic PVC part right here, then you're really screwed because then you have to go backwards to where the P-trap starts is over there. And then you gotta cut out some concrete and stuff. So you have to be careful when you cut off this bottom section here. Um, going forward, this is a transitional piece. This is a reducer or an increaser, depending on what you're using it for. Um, but this end is inch and a half female. And you have a uh, two inch female on this end. And then you have a street elbow. Street elbow means that there's no flange on this side, it just fits snug into this part here. Um, and so you have this 45 and this 45 going up. And when you put this inch and a half down onto this inch and a half pipe, snug it down tightly, just like that. Of course, it's going to get glued in. Um, and all three parts of here get glued in. Then you have 45, 45, and you're almost at slab level. And then you get your shower drain cap that goes on here. A piece will be cut out of uh, a two inch section of pipe that I have um, that will go inside here and then inside here that will marry these two together. Um, at this point, without all the glue in and everything, which will actually give me some more room, um, I'm still a little bit above slab level, not too bad, about an inch or so. Um, and I can deal with that. Once I glue that in, that'll pop down further. Um, once I glue this in, that'll pop down further. So I'll probably end up with about three quarters of a difference between the slab and the bottom of the of the drain cap. Um, so, well, not the cap, but you know, the, the rim. So um, that's basically what the plan is. Uh, once that goes in, then the excess um, hole right here will be filled in with concrete. I will pack down a bunch of concrete and make the slab contiguous so that then I can put my shower pan liner down there. Um, but unfortunately, we're about maybe eight, nine inches off of the wall, and that's where the shower drain will be. And I don't really like doing that. I'd rather have it center. But to get it center, I would have to cut um, a trough um, into the concrete. And as I said before, the customer doesn't want to go through all that hassle. Um, this is probably about uh, five inches of concrete thick. So it would be a lot of hassle to cut that trough. And then your 45 would bend up that way, and you would have the drain at the center. Okay, so what's going on here, uh, since I last was on camera, is that I have, um, I have built up this floor. And I'm going to explain that in a minute. This is a curb. When I refer to a curb, it's basically just three pressure-treated 2x4s, which I've just always, by default, used three. Um, the pressure-treated aspect is so that it won't rot out as quickly. Um, not that it will get wet, but should it get wet, then, then there's no issues of it rotting out. Um, so the process on a concrete floor, there is, uh, where is it at? It's a bang gun. It's what it's called on a concrete floor. You have what's called a bang gun. And this thing shoots out a 22, not a 22 bullet, but a 22 encased uh, shell. A uh, nail fits down inside of there. I wish I could show you how to work it, but a nail fits down inside of there. And then the reason it's called bang gun is because you bang on the top of here. I do it with a sledgehammer. You could do it with a hammer. And it's spring-loaded, so when you bang down on it, it hits that bullet that's inside of here. It's actually not a bullet, but uh, again, the 22 round. Um, and it drives a nail deep into the concrete. So what you're doing is hitting the wood. The first 2x4 here gets nailed in. Um, the only way to do these curbs on a concrete surface is to nail it down. Some people use um, construction adhesive and I guess that would work after it dries but I don't have the time to let it sit there and dry. Uh, so I prefer to nail it down and I'm doing at least, I'm going to say six to eight nails. Uh, definitely one on each end in the middle and then spaced out a couple here and a couple there. That's the first one. And then the other two by fours get nailed down with my nail gun. So that's how to set the curb up. These other pieces of wood are two by sixes. By default, I always use two by sixes between the stud, excuse me, between the studs all the way around in a shower. And the reason I do that is because a shower pan liner that I'm going to put in tomorrow 
will wrap around the curb and it will it will encompass this whole uh, shower area uh, shower floor area and then it will come up about six inches eight inches um, above and it's not always necessary in fact a lot of times I take out pan shower pans and I don't see the two by sixes at all it's one of my little quirks that I do um, I just like to have something solid for my pan to rest up against which is the reason I do them so that's what I nailed in today um, as well as the curb <clears throat> and the way what I showed you earlier about this drain the drain actually sets up um, higher than the concrete floor was and it's about an inch inch and a quarter higher um, and because the p-trap that I showed you earlier that's inside the dirt um, doesn't actually doesn't go deep enough for me to make all my turns and bends to get this shower um, drain in here properly um, that inch and a quarter room has to be taken up so I had to pour concrete on top of the concrete um, and it is about if you look on the inside of here with these three two by fours it takes up the full width of one of these two by fours which in this case is an inch and a half um, two by fours is not really two inches so it's about an inch and a half um, I said an inch and a quarter but um, it's about an inch and a half of concrete that had to get poured uh, which equates to about four either four or five bags of concrete 80 pounds that I had to pour which gets us to the flange now the bottom part of the flange right here is where the concrete got poured up to so uh, tomorrow when all this concrete is dry um, I'll be able to take out the top portion of this flange which I'll show you tomorrow and um, I can actually set the shower pan and then pour it and um, this concrete is real rock 80 pound concrete um, as you see I have some left over and that's what this is um, when I pour the shower pan it's going to be sand mix so it's a little different uh, shower pan is not actually concrete, it's sand mix. Um, some, type, some, type, some people call it mortar mix, but it's basically brick mortar is what it is. It doesn't have rocks in it the way concrete does. So that's, that's what it'll get poured tomorrow once all this is dried. At the same time, my customer bought the shower, new shower valve. So tomorrow two things will happen in succession. Uh, first, I'm not going to pour the pan first. Uh, first, I'll change out the valve. Uh, the sweating of the pipe and all that stuff, sometimes the solder drips down, sometimes it sparks out and stuff like that. So I don't want to put my pan liner down first because it'll burn right through, it's rubber, and it'll burn right through. So this gets done first before the pan liner. Once all of that's done and the shower, new shower valve sits up there nice and neat and everything, then my shower pan will be put down and I'll show you the process of doing that. And... Um, then it will get poured and then I have to wait overnight for that to dry again before I can start putting my wall board up or put my tile down or anything. Okay, this cement has dried overnight. Um, it's For the most part it's dry. Uh, there's some wet spots over there. That's actually for my sponge from doing um, some sweating the pipe. Um, I changed out the, the tub fixture that used to be here. As I said before, um, I don't know what they were doing here. They capped off a hot and a cold supply uh, for this side over here, and I'm not really sure why they capped it off. Um, I was going to use that, but that would have required doing a lot of 45s back and around, 45s back and around, and all that stuff. So um, the soft copper um, actually took my um, pieces that I put in here, the transition pieces, um, so that worked out pretty good, both of them. This one I had to bend it a little bit more because it's kind of uh, it wasn't quite straight up, um, but you know it's okay. And so I have the new copper in feeding the new um, fixture, and the valve itself has a cap on it. This is called a mud guard, and this protects the valve and the components of the valve and all that stuff as you're doing construction. So this will eventually come off, but for the time being, that stays on there. Um, typically, when you see these mud guards, um, your wall board will go up to a certain point, and then your tile goes up to a certain point. Um, and what it says on the face of the mud guard is that the outside edge of this is the furthest you can go with a finished wall. So I'm adhering to that, and I've already anchored this thing down. This is not going anywhere. 
I anchored it down on this side and I'm probably going to anchor it on this side before I enclose this area. But anyway, um, it is set. Um, I bumped up the shower head a little bit. It used to be down here on this 2x4, it's a little bit low, um, mainly because this floor has come up. Um, so I bumped that up a little bit, so it's a, it's a pretty good height right, right now. Um, getting back to the floor area, I'm getting ready to put my pan liner, and the pan liner is a PVC, uh, comes in gray and red or different colors. Okay, so the shower pan liner is set. Uh, these are relatively easy to manipulate. Um, the biggest deal on here is you don't want to perforate the pan. So, in other words, don't put a nail or a screw or any type of tear or rip or anything where there's going to be water. Um, so, the way I do pans, everybody does them a little bit different, is I always wrap the curb, as you can see. I bring my pan all the way to the bottom. There's excess that I always, you know, um, how would I say, I always buy a much larger piece than I actually need. I'd rather cut off the excess and have it come too short. Um, is there a particular reason why I wrap the pan and go all the way around? Well, because normally when I take out showers, uh, the pan liner that I see comes up to about the edge here of the inside of the curb, and I see a lot of wood rot that goes on just beyond that. Um, that has a lot to do with the way the tile was set and shower doors and a lot of different things, but um, and, and I don't anticipate that I would ever uh, do my tile in such a way that I would end up with wood rot, but I still use pressure treated 2x4s rather than just 2x4s and I always wrap my pan, um, or my curb rather, um, just because, I mean, why not? So anyway, what I do is I put screws at the bottom, uh, where those lines are is every 6 inches, 6 inches to each line, and just for sheer sake of, uh, I don't know, uniformity, um, I just put a screw every 6 inches. On the inside, and again, um, I can't really show you the process of setting this because I don't have somebody to hold the camera. But on the inside, when the pan is put in here, it probably rises above, you know, 12, 14, 16 inches all the way around here. I end up cutting off the excess. But what I do is um, some people use um, or roofing nail screw or roofing nails. Uh, I don't particularly like them, and just my preference is sheetrock screws. So. I put a screw way up high on the pan, uh, probably about every eight inches or so. I don't really, uh, really have a per se area that you know. Okay, one screw goes here and here. I just make sure that it's going to be stable. Um, so anyway, uh, the the pan actually gets folded in on itself when you come to the corner. Um, same as this other corner over here, it gets folded and then it gets folded in the corner where the back is. There are some guys and some videos that I've seen where there's a pretty good gap between these two studs and people will just push in the excess pan inside there. Uh, that doesn't make any sense because to me, you know, the excess pan is going to fold down and when you pour the pan, the, the mortar is going to go through and, and if mortar goes through, water can go through. So I don't really like that idea. Even when I have an excess gap between these two studs, I never do that. Um, I always double up my pan and make sure that it's folded on the inside because when my wall board goes on on both sides, if it's going to bump out at all, it's going to bump out on both ends here and here rather than just willy-nilly doing a fold here and then a fold on the back over here. So again, for uniformity's sake. Um, I put a couple of screws at the top of here and uh, about a foot later here, about eight inches later here. It's kind of sporadic. Um, there's no set number of screws to put on there. I just make sure that I put enough that I know that the pan liner is going to hold up. On the back here, uh, you see I've got quite an excess of screws. Anyway, getting to here, this is probably one of the most important um, aspects when you're setting a pan liner, when you're actually building a shower and doing the pan liner. Pan liner is everything. You know, this thing is literally uh, saving you from any type of leakage whatsoever. And if it's done wrong in any respect whatsoever, then you're going to have issues. There's a couple of my videos you'll see where they've actually cut in the corner here, and then and then run the flap up under the other one, thinking that that's going to do some good, um, and having leak issues there. Uh, was big time on that particular video. Uh, in fact, I think they had them all three corners, I believe. Anyway, you don't perforate anywhere than you 
any more than you need to. So you would never do it in the corners like that. And obviously you would never do it on the surface here. The only time you perforate a pan is when you have to set the flange. The flange for the drain actually goes on here. You saw it just a little earlier uh, where I took this off, this part off, and I took the bolts out. And so what happens is I take a razor knife and I make a little tiny X. Actually, I put my finger up under. Well, let me back up. Um, I cut across, and I cut across not quite where where the drain opening is at right here, and not quite up to there, uh, probably an inch shy of there. I cut across like that and like that. The reason I do that is because more often than not, I see when I take out showers as well as when I watch other videos on YouTube where plumbers and tilers will actually cut a circle. I mean, literally a circle right where the drain opening is at. And that's just like the dumbest thing that I can imagine because if you ever have an issue where uh, your drain clogs up and you get a bunch of excess water sitting in your shower, um, then there is a possibility that water could find its way up under that circle that you've cut. There are some guys that will actually put a bead of caulking first and then after they cut the circle, they'll put a bead of caulking up under there and push it down and then they think when they put the flange on that the caulking is going to hold. Well, you don't know if it's going to hold or not. And I just don't see the point in cutting a big old circle in a pan that's not really supposed to be perforated. In this case, we have to perforate it somewhat, but the least amount possible, the better. And so what I've always done is I've cut an, an X or a cross, if you will, not quite up to the edge you know, on both sides so that when I push this down inside there, those flaps will fold inward. And any excess water has to drain down. There, it doesn't have a choice but to do that. Anyway, the way that I get my bolts in there is I, once I've cut this X, I just feel up under there where the hole for the bolt is going to go. And I cut a very, very, very tiny small X right there. And then I push the bolt through the pan liner and into the hole and, you know, screw it down. Uh, not all the way at first uh, because the flange goes on first. And this is how it sets. Once these bolts are lined up to the flange, you just put a little extra pressure, downward pressure, and then turn it. I'm trying to do it with one hand. And then when you turn it, it locks in. Now you can go ahead and tighten the bolts down. And if you notice, there's a little bit of those liner pieces right there. And then of course when I screw uh, the drain cap down into there, it'll push liner pieces downward. Um, so I know without a doubt that any excess water has to go down into the drain. There's just no two ways about it. Um, and I'm comfortable with that and I've done that ever since I've done this type of work, you know, 15 years ago. It just kind of spoke to me and said this is the way it should, you know, it should go. And other people aren't doing it that way, and I wish them luck, but that's the way I do it. Okay, the shower pan is poured. This is uh, the same mortar mix I was telling you about, sand mix, um, brick mortar. Um, I think I went through four bags, but I ended up with a little excess. So probably about three, three and a half bags of this mix. Um, as I said earlier, there are some things you can get at Home Depot and Lowe's and stuff like that. There are tracks or whatever to find out if your slope is okay. Some people do a little marking on the edge of the pan to figure out their slope. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can do that. Um, I've just been doing it for so long that I can kind of feel as I spread this out and I trowel it that, um, that I have a slope and then I check it with the level. And it probably takes, by the time I pour all this, it probably takes me about uh, another 20 minutes to 30 minutes to, to get all this uh, mortar to exactly where I want it so I have a nice slope. And you can usually tell on the inside here, this is a little thinner on the inside of that pan. This is a little thicker on the inside of the pan. So obviously I do have the slope going down. Um, when this dries out tomorrow, I'm gonna put a fan on it, but when it dries out tomorrow, any inconsistencies that there are, it's not, it's not like concrete, uh, if there's inconsistencies I can take um, um, my blade and I can kind of scrape away at the inconsistencies so I'm not too concerned about you know this not being being able to manipulate it. Um, so um, anyway, there's nothing I can do, my hands are tied until this dries and 
Uh, tomorrow's another day. Anyway, getting back to the shower. <clears throat> um, as you remember, the pan got poured and now today I put up the sheetrock and uh, sealed up all the seams and everything. Um, the curb, um, what I do is I butter my curb. Um, so let me explain. When I wrap my curb with the pan liner, um, Durarock, well, I do this, I don't know if other tilers do it or not. Durarock goes onto that curb, it goes on the face, on the inside, and the top. And I use half inch Durarock, uh, Wonderboard. I would never use Hardybacker, but Wonderboard or Durarock is fine. Half inch, and I, I actually put that Durarock on both sides first, and then I put a cap of Durarock on the very top of it. How I put it in is I screw it in. And again, you're not supposed to perforate the liner, but no tiler has ever been able to figure out a better way to do it. So that's what we do. Um, so I'll put typically a screw will go in here, 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 about every six, seven inches apart, all the way over along there. And then I double up and I put double screws here, 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 about every six, eight inches. And then on the top, I do the same thing. Two screws down here, 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 here. Um, the screw heads get recessed into the Durarock, and then I butter the curb. And in this case, not only did I butter the curb, but I put a second layer of Durarock on the top of that without screwing it down. And the reason why is because, you remember, I had a little low spot down here at the end, and I wanted to heighten that up a little bit, because eventually I'm going to have to put tile there, so I want the strip of tile to be thick enough to actually make a difference. So I doubled up on the, on the Durarock, and I put a second layer of Durarock which I use thin set to butter with. Um, so in other words, I put the thin set down first on the top and then put a uh, second layer of Dura Rock and pushed it down on that, um, which when it dries, it'll be hard as a rock and the two pieces will mesh together. And then I butter it. So I'm using thin set, Versabon is the brand, and I'm using thin set and I butter the whole curb. And I do that for two reasons. One. It gives me a feeling of a, a much harder uh, contiguous piece rather than having the dirt rock wrapped around it, period, and then just go ahead and tile it. I just feel like it's more contiguous if I have um, the buttering done. Second reason, and probably most important, is because it hides all the screw heads. Not only hides them, but it, you know, it seals them, so to speak. Um, and then in addition to that, when this curb dries, the red guard is going to go over the curb and as well as the walls, I explained that before. The red guard will get painted on, you know, from where the seam is at all the way, in fact, we're taking the tile to the top. So the red guard will be on all three walls, including the niche, um, at least two coats, maybe three, and then the curb gets painted with red guard as well. Okay, um, I have actually started tiling. I was gonna show the red guard that, um, that I applied to it after I did, you know, the, all the preparation for the tile and everything. Um, I actually red guarded uh, all three walls as I always do, you see. Um, red guard is a brand name. There's different types of uh, water barrier type products. Um, I believe there's three coats on these walls. Um, what you didn't see, the red guard obviously goes all the way down to the bottom and the red guard has three coats that wrap around the curb. So when I buttered the curb before using my thin set, um, that there's just for me filling all the screw heads and stuff like that but then in addition to that the red guard goes around it and then of course tile goes on top of it um, so there's no never going to be an issue with the curb anyway uh, I went ahead and did um, the floor as you can see this is two by two and the two by two comes on a mat so that actually goes first before the wall tile goes up that goes first so that that all of this tile goes up against the raw part of the wall and once that's dried overnight then it gets routed and again because it's going up against the wall this tile goes on top of that grout line um, so the water runs off and just as a matter of rule I always do my floor tile in the shower first before I ever put a wall tile up and so that's basically it um, I'm sorry I wasn't able to show you the red guard part um, but you can see where I had actually done the curve too. Some people have asked me um, once the mortar is poured and it's dried out for a couple days um, and then of course I red guard the walls and the curb could you also red guard the floor before you set the tile? 
Um, I'm undecided on that. Uh, I don't see uh, an issue with it. It would preclude any water from ever reaching inside of the pan. Um, but I'm not quite there yet. I'm not quite comfortable red guarding the floor um, and then setting my tile on top of the red guard. I don't know why because I do it on the walls, but um, I'm just not there yet. So um, that kind of answers that question if you had one about red guard. Um, anyway, uh, I'm almost done here. I've actually started on the floor. She wanted this 18 by 18 on a diagonal on the floor, so I went ahead and knocked that out last night. Um, I've got about maybe four or five more pieces that I've got to cut around here, and then I think about two, two and a half pieces going up to the ceiling. So that'll take me the next probably two or three hours to accomplish that. And then tomorrow I'll grout the entire thing. I'll put the toilet back and I'll put the new vanity in. Um, actually, they bought a new toilet. So a new toilet and a new vanity go in here. And then this bathroom will be done. And um, I will come back and show you the finished product once I'm done. Okay, I am done with this bathroom. And um, it's actually looking pretty good. This. Uh, this tile is very thick, this um, polished travertine is very thick and it just so happened to match up to this floor. I was going to put a, um, the aluminum transition strip that I normally do uh, to protect the tile against vacuum cleaners and stuff like that, but in this case um, the transition strip was kind of redundant, didn't really need one on here. Um, it's a really good smooth transition from this uh, pergo floor to the tile. Um, they wanted a diagonal, of course, and so that's what I did. Uh, shower turned out pretty good, and um, this is also the 18 by 18 travertine. Normally, I like to do the contiguous curb tops, but um, I didn't have one. They don't have them down here in Florida, so I wasn't able to do it on here, but I did use uh, the 18, and then uh, I think but there was about a four inch cut down at the end that I put down at the end. I didn't want to split the difference because I didn't want like a two inch over here and a two inch over there. So that's what I did. Uh, the curb top is sloped in. They currently have a shower curtain because they're, they're literally using the shower, I mean, a day after it was finished. Um, but eventually they'll put um, a panel and then a door will go right here, probably a 24, 28 inch door will go here as well. And so this curb is sloped downward for that. Um, the tile is on a, on a mat. It's a two by two tile, but it's on a mat. And so that's all sloped down to the drain. Um, I was trying to get the drain a little further out, but as you recall, this is a bathtub. And the best I could do was about, well, it looks like about six inches, seven inches out from the wall. Anyway, uh, they didn't want to foot the bill for the trim pieces, the bull nose and stuff like that, so I ended up using the transition strip, um, a copper color transition strip. It's not quite the same thickness as a tile. This tile is very thick, but that's what they wanted and that's what I did. I would still rather have used a bull nose or some type of trim, same trim as I used in the niche. Um, the border that they chose, uh, this is also on a mat and these pieces came off of the mat for the top and the bottom and then this is glass so we used three rows of this glass with a different color grout to match that as well as inside the niche um, that's I think about three sheets of glass that tile that's in there um, same thing use a different color grout on that um, this trim which would have been nice had it been darker uh, to put on the side here is what I would prefer to do um, they couldn't find anything darker at Home Depot, so that's what we ended up using. It didn't turn out too bad. And of course, the niche is sloped in, so the water uh, drains off of it. Took the tile all the way up to the ceiling. You know, a new shower fixture um, got installed. And, you know, it, it, it's okay. It's a whole lot better than what the tub was. And uh, that's, that's about all there is to it. That's, that's uh, how you take out a tub and make a shower. Um, this took me, I said five days at the beginning, I think it took me six days because um, the issue that I had with the concrete um, slab, well, actually the slab was, was so low compared to the P-trap. The P-trap is under grade level, in other words, um, you have about five or six inches of concrete that is a slab and then the P-trap is up under that. Usually it's a little deeper so that I can, I can make my transition back up and put a drain in. Um, to this lab level, but in this case it wasn't possible. I had to pour about another 
think about two inches of concrete on top of the slab. Um, and so that's kind of the reason that, um, that I ended up taking six days because I had to wait for that concrete to dry. But um, pretty much it's five days in and out. And um, of course, put a new toilet in. It's a water saver toilet. So it has uh, little buttons on here number one and number two, four, number one and number two. A little bit of water for one, a lot of water for two. Um, I think these toilets are basically free in Georgia because you get a rebate. I think it's a hundred dollar rebate and they cost about a hundred dollars. So um, I put quite a few of those in. Um, they managed to get a really, really nice vanity, which, which I like. It's actually a real wood. And I think they spent a, a good amount of money for it, but um, it's kind of sort of freestanding and it worked out really well. In fact, it's the same size as the old vanity. Uh, this top um, came separate. It's a marble top with, uh, it's not even an undermount sink. This is really cool. Most of them nowadays are undermount sinks that are glued on. This one is actually contiguous. There is, there is no break. I don't know how quite that they did this, but um, there, there's nothing there. There's no ridge at all whatsoever. So it's just this marble looking thing and then and then the white sink below it um, with a pop-up. Uh, the pop-up is really cool. I like those. And uh, of course a new faucet. Um, the rest of it uh, I don't do. I don't do painting or any of that stuff so that's up to them. But I'm done in here. 